when I, when I came to Erie, I arrived as a systems modeler. And um, Erie was trying out what they called a new plan type. And there'd been a lot of publicity surrounding the new plan type. The new plan type was supposed to deliver five tons more than the existing indicas. It was going to take the maximum yield you could achieve in the indicas, which was about 10 tons, to 15 tons. And so it was going to solve the problem of population increase in Asia. And uh, it was based on some physiological principles. Right? The existing indicas produce lots of tillers. Uh, some of them died off. That was unproductive. If you could have a, a lower tillering variety, you could trans transfer that material into grains so you could increase grain yields. And they made lots of bold claims ab about it, uh, but it wasn't working out. You know, they weren't able to make it work. And there was a lot of discussion about why isn't it working? You know, this should be working. It isn't working. And there were all sorts of theories bandied about the place. The research director at that time was called Ken Fisher. The head of the project was uh, Gerdif Kush. And Ken wanted somebody with a physiological background and a quantitative background to actually take control and, and perhaps direct the research a little better and take it away from optimism to realism. And um, so I was given this difficult job of running this, you know, this large group. I set about running some experiments to take the yields of indica rice and the new plant type to, them, to their limit. I came across two big problems. Um, the first was that when I could get the new plant type, persuade the new plant type um, to do its thing and grow well, its yield, its maximum yield, was just about ex exactly the same as the indica rice, the traditional indica rice. They were both about the same. And um, so there was no improvement in their maximum yield. So the claim that they could deliver five tons more than the indica just wasn't true. Another problem um, uh, arose, and that was to do with pests. The, the new plant type had very thick stems, it was very sturdy, very thick tiller bases, um, and a new type of stem borer attacked it. The indicas had always been attacked by I think um, maybe striped stem borers, and they cut in, they were small, and they cut into the base of the panicle, and you get a white head. You know, very clear sign of, um, of damage. Um, but with the uh, new plant type, it attracted a different kind of stem borer, and they cut the base of the plant, and they cohabited, about five or six of them lived in there, and they chewed around the base. They didn't feed on the phloem transport, and so they weakened the whole plant, and eventually, this you know, plant would just fall down. So the whole thing would collapse in chaos. So there were two problems. If you could prevent that happening, it didn't have the extra yield potential at all, and it was vulnerable um, to these, to these, uh, these uh, stem borers of a different sort to the, to the indica, which meant that this was not the plant type for the future. Right. I then stepped back and said, well, it, you know, what's the problem? Why can't we push yields up? You know, what, what's limiting us? Where, where is the limitation coming from? And after a while, I decided that it was what they call a source limitation. There wasn't enough um, assimilate being captured through photosynthesis to build this extra yield. Now, prior to that, there'd been a belief that it was sink limited, okay, that there weren't enough spikelets to be filled, and that the plant could capture as much carbohydrate through photosynthesis as, as, as was required, um, but it couldn't deliver it anyway because they weren't developing you know, the, uh, the sites for filling. In my experiments, I showed that wasn't true, that, um, that the, both the new plant type and the indica produced somewhere in the region of 100, 150,000 juvenile spikelets, and they both were only filling about 40,000. Of, of them. So, it, you know, that wasn't the issue. The issue was neither one of them was able to capture more photosynthesis. They weren't photosynthesizing um, at a high enough rate to build, you know, more structures and fill the available sites. Now, I knew that C4 photosynthesis was more efficient than C3 photosynthesis. 
and that rice was a C3 um, by nature. Um, and I then wondered, would it be possible to install or encourage the C4 syndrome into rice? I asked myself also, does the C4 syndrome exist in any of the wild relatives of rice? You know, can we go out and find traces of it in the wild population? And then, if we can, can we bring them all together uh, in some way um, and start up the C4 engine in rice, capture um, more carbohydrate and build more yield? Now, the, the interesting thing was that the C4 system, C4 plants like maize, were 50% more efficient at converting solar energy into biomass and grain than rice. And the 50% figure was significant, of course, because that was what we were facing and still are facing in terms of population increase. So it was, it was a, you know, the potential was huge and it, and it would fill the gap between what we could do and what we needed to do um, over the next 30, 40 years. Um, so I began to ask around if there were, you know, if there was anybody interested in doing this, was anybody attempting to do it? And it turned out there was a Japanese guy called Matsuoka, who was a molecular biologist and a brilliant man, and he'd been playing with the, with the concept. Um, and so um, I, I, I met him and, and had a chat to him and said, you know, what do you think? Do you think this is possible? And he said, yes, I do think it's possible. So I then went to see... Um, I went to see Fisher, Ken Fisher, and I said, look, Ken, I think we're going to have to change the photosynthetic capacity of our rice plants if we really are serious about delivering a 50% increase in yield. Um, and what we'll need to do is, is call in experts from around the world, have a meeting, and discuss, can we improve photosynthesis by the amount that's going to be required, i.e., can we take um, uh, C3 photosynthesis up to the levels of C4, or you know, is it possible to take C4 photosynthesis and stick it in rice or unleash it in, in rice in some way? Um, the consensus was that we probably could. I, when I went to Seattle, you know, to discuss these issues, what, what amazed me was they weren't so interested in rice. They were interested in legumes in Africa. So they asked me, would this work in, in, a, in a legume in Africa? And I said, well, look, if it'll work in rice in Asia, I'm pretty certain we could, we could work it in, in legumes in Africa. I mean, the difficulty is going to be making it work in rice, first of all. Um, so it, it was driven out of, again, necessity. Um, it seemed to be, I th well, and it is, in, in my mind to this day, the only way you are going to increase yields by, right yields by 50%, you're not going to do it any other way. Because if you're going to build, you know, 50% more biomass, 50% more grain, um, you've got to remember 40% of the grain and the biomass is made of carbon. And carbon comes from photosynthesis, so you have to increase photosynthesis. There's no, you know, there's no other way forward um, in terms of doing that. And I, I didn't think it could be one, one gene, because if it was one gene, it would be happening all the time. You know, it had to be a small number of genes. It couldn't be a large number of genes, or it would never happen. You could calculate, you know, that it would be impossible. Um, and I figured out that there were probably two, two areas of the genome that were important in terms of mutation. There, were, there had been some experiments done on driving um, on mutating C4s and the consequences of those. And I'd looked at the numbers in, in those publications and I'd done some statistical calculations, you know, and those calculations suggested to me that there were at least two, but not more than, not more than three regions which had been mutated in terms of the numbers of plants that had emerged from this experiment that were, that were modified. Um, so it seemed to me a tractable problem, you know, it, it was not, it wasn't, wasn't an impossible um, problem. Another thing, um, money, yeah? I mean, the Gates Foundation were wonderful, they were very generous, gave us $20 million. We managed to build an international consortium of scientists who were interested in this. The wonderful thing about the Gates Foundation is that it will fund an international group of scientists across national boundaries, binds them all together in a team to solve the problem. You know, national um, uh, science foundations don't do that, they fund their own scientists. So, so Gates is very liberating in, in, in that particular 
in that particular uh, way. Money is essential to solve these kinds of problems, and I, I have a feeling that you know, if we do hit major food production starvation kind of issues, then much more money will flow into this kind of research, and our progress will be accelerated. You know, we'd be able to sequence lots of, uh, of, 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 of plants. We'd be able to do you know, rather more sophisticated experiments at a genetic level, um, and, and progress would be, would be, the rate of progress would be increased. The Gates Foundation, wonderfully generous though they were, you know, knew that this was you know, a, a, a difficult area, and so wanted to dip their toes in. They didn't want to stand in the, you know, the, as it were, the water of the project up to their ankles immediately. And they certainly weren't going to go in up to their knees. Um, at some stage, we probably would need that kind of level of investment, though, to make the breakthroughs in a reasonable space of time. The reason, again, I like C4 um, as, as a solution was that it had occurred in evolution, so we were imitating nature, we weren't trying to invent something from scratch, that it had occurred 60 times, independent times in nature, um, so it had been invented many times, um, which made it seem as if it was not so difficult to do, right? That the, the difficulty would be discovering what the triggers for the change were. And, and uh, you know, there's always been discussion about that. For me, um, I used to think, well, we're sequencing the genome now. Rice, the rice genome has been sequenced. The genome of sorghum, the a C4 plant, has, you know, has been sequenced as well. Surely, once these genomes have been sequenced, we can compare them and start to look at the differences. And when we identify those differences, we can ask the question, is, you know, are these differences the ones that account for the C4 syndrome? Another idea I had was, if we take sorghum, which has been sequenced, and we mutate it, we can drive it back to its original C3 state. So the, the evolutionary idea was that you know, all plants were C3, and then 20 million years ago, C4 evolved under low CO2 conditions as an add-on. The, the, the principal add-on is a, a change in um, the anatomy of, of the leaf. Um, and the location of um, the chloroplasts uh, in, in, within that leaf structure. So if, if it had happened lots of times and it was an add-on, we should be able to take something like sorghum, mutate it, and drive the C4 bit, knock the C4 bit out, if you like, and reveal the underlying C3 syndrome. And in those plants that, that um, reverted to C3 status, yeah, we should be able to get those plants, sequence them, compare them to the, uh, the, uh, the, the, sorghum, the normal wild-type sorghum genome and see which bits we'd mutate, uh, mutated. So, you know, this process would gradually reveal um, what, what had driven the change from C3 to C4. Um, now, at the time, when, again, when we were starting off, sequencing was expensive. You could sequence, I think, seven plants for about $3 million. Well, there was no way we were going to get $3 million to do s seven plants. Somebody was going to give us that money. But, of course, I'd been reading about the $1,000 genome, and I knew that the health industry in the United States was really going for sequencing in a big way. You know, so, so the medical sciences would probably be inventing the technologies and, and making the whole process much cheaper so that by the time we went down the road a bit in our experiments, we'd be able to take advantage of those cheap technologies and sequence our mutants, sequence our C4s and C3s, and get on the road to uh, gene discovery. Okay, that was, so that was how I was viewing it.